Distinguished guests, speakers, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, good evening to all of you, and thank you for coming. My name is Julia Papageorgiou, and I am the acting head of the Directorate of Byzantine and Post-Byzantine Antiquities of uh, the Ministry of Culture and Sports, and also a member of the Administrative Board of European Center of Byzantine and Post-Byzantine Monuments. It is a honor and a privilege for me to welcome you on behalf of the European Center of Byzantine and Post-Byzantine Monuments to this hybrid international symposium entitled Rediscovering Hora, the Byzantine name of the rose. On behalf of the organizers, I would like to, th to thank warmly all the participants and you. At this point, I must inform you that, unfortunately, the Minister of Culture and Sports, Dr. Lina Mendoni, due to an unexpected obligation, will not be able to be with us tonight. However, she wishes us a very successful symposium. And now, it is a pleasure to invite Mrs. Natalia Poulou, Professor of Byzantine Archaeology of the Aristotle University of Thessaloniki and President of the Administrative Board of European Center of Byzantine and Post-Byzantine Monuments, to deliver her welcome speech. So, good afternoon, dear colleagues and dear participants. The European Center for Byzantine and Post-Byzantine Monuments is an organization supervised by the Greek Ministry of Culture, active since 1998 in the fields of study, restoration, conservation, and transferring of the relevant know-how to third countries. From the very beginning up to now, it has contributed to the restoration of Byzantine and post-Byzantine monuments outside Greece, in Albania and Serbia, in organizing exhibitions in Bulgaria and Albania, in the restoration of mosaics in the Middle East, and uh, in uh, implementing cultural projects funded by European programs and other sources. Continuing the very important work that uh, uh, achieved so far, we have recently signed two memoranda of understanding with the ministries of culture of North Macedonia and Albania, aiming at the restoration of the frescoes at St. George in Kurbinovo and St. Nicolaus at Mesopotamo. Within the framework of the constant scientific interest on the study of the rich Byzantine cultural heritage, we decided to organize this international symposium dedicated to one of the most important Byzantine monuments and one of the best preserved religious buildings in Constantinople, the, Ho the Hora Monastery. We are lucky to have rich information on the history of the monument, uh, deriving both from textual and archaeological evidence. Although regarded as one of the oldest buildings of Constantinople, written sources attest that uh, the monastery got partially destroyed during the 9th century and got repaired with imperial support on uh, 843, when Mikhail Singelos became its abbot. The building in its current form is the result of multiple building phases dating from the 11th until the 14th century that are connected to the imperial families of the Komnini and the Paleologi. It is important to point out that the Kora Monastery was an imperial monastery, Basiliki Moni supported by the Byzantine court throughout its long history. Although its history is parallel to Constantinople's, it is mostly famous for its phase dating in the 14th century. This is the golden period of the monument when it got restored by Theodoros Metochitis, 
the Minister of the Treasury and the richest and most powerful man in the empire after the emperor. The Hora Monastery has been an endless field of argumentation considering its uh, codified artistic vocabulary. Besides the monastic use of the Hora, the character of its iconographical programs offers a rare for the Byzantine Empire paradigm of uh, scholasticism thriving in Italy during the 14th century. It is not my intention to present here the innumerable fascinating evidence we have on the monument. Besides, this is not my intention for this brief greeting. My distinguished colleagues, whose papers we are looking forward to listening afterwards, will analyze and present the available evidence in a way that will make visible the enigmatic and multiple interpretive levels of the decoration of the Hora to Ahoritu, uh, as well as uh, new interpretations for its history and architecture. Taking under consideration the rich and great architectural and artistic value of this uh, monument, the European Center of Byzantine and Post-Byzantine Monuments decided to organize this scientific symposium, which aims at raising uh, awareness of its importance. The organizing of the symposium from the European Center of Byzantine and Post-Byzantine Monuments comes in a period that the Turkish government announced a change in the status of Hora from a museum to a mosque, a decision that raised a great, great number of protests from the international scientific community. We really hope that this symposium will contribute to retaining alive the discussion about Hora and to remind all of us of its great role to the development of Byzantine art and architecture. I would like really, like, I would like really to thank a lot my colleague, Professor Athanasio Semoulou, Vice President of the European Center for Byzantine and post-Byzantine monuments for having the idea to organize this symposium and proposing this to our center. Consequently, I would also like to thank the members of the administrative board of EKVIM who immediately accepted his proposal to organize the symposium in which we are now participating. It is of great honor and pleasure for us that several distinguished scholars, experts in their fields from the United States, from Europe, including Greece, of course, from Russia and Turkey, accepted our invitation to participate in the symposium, providing us with the latest results of their studies on this brilliant monument. Besides them, I would like also to thank the members of the scientific committee, professors, Engina Kureka, Michele Bazzi, Rob Robert Osterhout, and Nancy Savchenko for their contribution. Additionally, I would like to express my personal thanks to the team of the European Center who worked a lot during these months to organize the symposium to the director, Dr. Flora Carigliani, who had the supervision of the organization, as well as to the archaeologists, Hara Sergianidou and Sofia Tatharopoulou, who worked on every detail. Lastly, I would like to thank a lot the administrative board of the War Museum and this president, Mr. Anastasio Liascos, for the hospitality. I wish good luck to the works of this symposium. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Pulo. And uh, I think that uh, now we can begin with the works of our conference. 
Our symposium has two sessions, uh, with the first one taking part place right now and the second one being scheduled for tomorrow morning. I would like to remind you that in today's session we have four speeches. Every speaker will have 25 minutes for the, their presentation. The speeches will be followed by a 30 minutes discussion. Before we get started, please either turn off your mobile phones or put them on silent. Thank you, and let's begin. Now, I would like to invite Assistant Professor of Byzantine Literature of the Aristotle University of Thessaloniki, Mr. Elias Taxidis, to give his speech, which is entitled, The Ekphrasis of the Hora Monastery in Theodore Metochitis Poem, Δοξολογία εις Θεών και περί των χαρίτων των καθαυτών και της μονής της χώρας. You have all our full attention, Mr. Taxidis. Ευχαριστώ πολύ για την προσφώνηση. Ελπίζω να φαίνεται, ε, έχω κάνει διαμοιρασμό της οθόνης, να είναι ορατό. Ε, καταρχάς... Ε, θα ήθελα ε, από καρδιάς να ευχαριστήσω το Ευρωπαϊκό Κέντρο Βυζαντινών και Μεταβυζαντινών Νημείων ε, για τη φιλοξενία και την ε, οργάνωση αυτού του συνεδρίου και ιδιαίτερος τους αγαπητούς συναδέλφους από το Αριστοτέλειο Πανεπιστήμιο την ε, κυρία Ναταλία Πούλου και τον κύριο Θανάση Σέμογλου για την τιμητική τους πρόσκληση και την εμπιστοσύνη που δείχνουν στο πρόσωπό μου. Ε, θα ήμουν εκεί. Λυπάμαι πάρα πολύ πραγματικά που για προσωπικούς λόγους δεν μπορώ να είμαι μαζί σας. Ε, ελπίζω όμως στο μέλλον να δοθούν ανάλογες ευκαιρίες για να ξανασυναντηθούμε εκ του συνέγγις. Με την ανακατάληψη της Κωνσταντινούπολης το 1261, εκτός από την προσπάθεια ανασύνταξης και αναδιοργάνωσης του διαλυμένου κράτους, δόθηκε ιδιαίτερη βαρύτητα στην ανασυγκρότηση της παιδείας, καθώς και στην καλλιέργεια των γραμμάτων. Οι βάσεις για τη λεγόμενη παλαιολόγια αναγέννηση ασφαλώς είχαν τεθεί πριν από μισό αιώνα στη Νίκαια, ενώ καταλητικό ρόλο έπαιξε και η άνοδος στο θρόνο του Ανδρονίκου Δευτέρου Παλαιολόγου, ενός πνευματικού αυτοκράτορα, ο οποίος σε μια ιδιαίτερα κρίσιμη πολιτικά, οικονομικά και θρησκευτικά περίοδο συντέλεσε ώστε η πολιτισμική ζωή της αυτοκρατορίας να ανυψωθεί σε βαθμό που δεν είχε φτάσει ποτέ άλλοτε. Επέλεξε έτσι να περιβάλλεται από μορφωμένους ανθρώπους στους οποίους έδωσε πολλά αξιώματα όπως τον Νικηφόρο Χούμνο, τον Κωνσταντίνο Ακροπολίτη και τον Θεόδωρο Μετοχίτη και αντίστοιχα να στελεχώσει την εκκλησιαστική ιεραρχία με λόγιους πατριάρχες όπως τον Γρηγόριο Δεύτερο Κύπριο και τον Ιωάννη 13ο Γλυκή. Στην πνευματική αναγέννηση της περίοδου σημαντική υπήρξε και η συμβολή του Γεωργίου Παχημέρη ο οποίος κυρίως με το ιστοριογραφικό, το ρητορικό και το φιλοσοφικό του έργο κατόρθωσε να αναδείξει το πνευματικό κλίμα της εποχής. Μέσα σε ένα τέτοιο πνευματικό περιβάλλον και η ρητορική όπως ήταν φυσικό και αναμενόμενο δεν έποψε να κατέχει σημαντική θέση στην πολιτική και θρησκευτική ζωή της Βυζαντινής Αυτοκρατορίας κατά την ύστερη περίοδο. Ο κυρίαρχος ρόλος της ε, στη λογοτεχνική παραγωγή τεκμηριώνεται από το γεγονός ότι διατρέχει κάθε είδος της Βυζαντινής λογοτεχνίας και παραμένει παρούσα σε όλο το φάσμα της. Από την αγιολογία και την επιστολογραφία μέχρι τις ιστορικές αφηγήσει και τα εντελώς τεχνικά θα λέγαμε έργα όπως τα μαθητικά σχέδια ή τις εξειδικευμένες επιστημονικές πραγματίες. Το ενδιαφέρον για την καλλιέργεια της ρητορικής κατά την ύστερη βυζαντινή περίοδο επιβεβαιώνεται εκτός των άλλων και από την πρόνοια της αυτοκρατορίας να επιχορηγούνται από το Δημόσιο Ταμείο οι δάσκαλοι της ρητορικής. Μέσα σε ένα τέτοιο πλαίσιο διέπρεψε και ο Θεόδωρος Μετοχήτης. Ένας από τους πιο αξιόλογους αξιωματούχους και παραγωγικούς λογίους της εποχής, ο οποίος γεννήθηκε στην Κωνσταντινούπολη το 1270. Εξαιτίας της εξορίας του πατέρα του, Γεωργίου Μετοχήτη, μεγάλωσε στην Νίκαια. 
Εκεί γνωρίστηκε με τον Ανδρόνικο Δεύτερο Παλαιολόκο, περίπου το 1290, όταν κατά τη διάρκεια επίσκεψης του αυτοκράτορα απήγγειλε ενώπιον του έναν εγκομιαστικό λόγο για την πόλη. Ο Ανδρόνικος, εκτιμώντας τη μόρφωσή του, τον ενέταξε στην αυτοκρατορική αυλή, στην οποία κατέλαβε διαδοχικά τα αξιώματα του συγκλητικού, του λογοθέτη των αγελών, του λογοθέτη των οικιακών, ενώ παράλληλα συμμετείχε σε πολλές διπλωματικές αποστολές. Τη διετία 1303-1305 βρέθηκε στη Θεσσαλονίκη, στο πλευρό της αυτοκράτηρας Ειρήνης, ενώ με την επιστροφή του στην Κωνσταντινούπολη ανέλαβε το αξίωμα του μεγάλου λογοθέτη, διαγράφοντας στη συνέχεια μια λαμπρή πορεία, όχι μόνο στον χώρο της Βυζαντινής διοίκηση, αλλά και σε αυτόν της λόγιας γραφείας. Το 1328, ύστερα από τα γεγονότα του πρώτου εμφυλίου πολέμου μεταξύ των Ανδρονίκων Δευτέρου και Τρίτου, εξορίστηκε στο Δηδημότυχο, ενώ το 1332 πέθανε στην Κωνσταντινούπολη, όπου στο μεταξύ είχε επιστρέψει. Απόλυτα συνηφασμένη με τη δράση του Θεοδόρου Μετοχήτη, είναι ως γνωστόν και η ιστορία της Μονής του Χριστού της χώρας και της βιβλιοθήκης της κατά την παλαιολόγια εποχή την οποία ανακαίνησε ο διαπρεπής λόγιος αξιωματούχο κατά την περίοδο 1316 με 1321. Με δεδομένο ότι η Μονή υπέστη μεγάλες καταστροφές κατά τα χρόνια της Λατινοκρατίας και δεν μπορούσε να κατοικηθεί παρά μετά από την ολοκλήρωση της ανακαίνησής της από το μετοχή τη, λίγα είναι τα χειρόγραφα της βιβλιοθήκης της που χρονολογούνται πριν από το 13ο αιώνα και ακόμη λιγότερα Αυτά που πιθανότατα ανήκαν στον αρχαιότερο πλούτο της Μονής και δεν σχετίζονται σε καμία περίπτωση με τον ανακαινιστή της. Πρόκειται για ένα Ευαγγελιάριο του 11ου αιώνα, για ένα αντίγραφο του έργου του Ιωάννη της Κλίμακος, καθώς και για κώδικες που περιλαμβάνουν διαλόγους του Πλάτωνα και έργα του Διοδόρου Σικεϊώτη και του Πτολεμαίου. Στη βιβλιοθήκη της Μονής, Ανήκε επίσης ένα βιβλίο με τα πρακτικά της πρώτης Οικουμενικής Συνόδου. Μετεγράφει το παρόν βιβλίο των πρακτικών της Οικουμενικής Πρώτης Συνόδου από βιβλίου παλαιού μεμβράνου του Μοναστηρίου της χώρας. Ενώ για ορισμένα άλλα κοσμικού περιεχομένου χειρόγραφα πιθανολογείται βάσει παλαιογραφικών δεδομένων και χαρακτηριστικών τους ότι αποτελούσαν κτήμα της. Το σημαντικότερο ωστόσο τμήμα της βιβλιοθήκης της Μονής της χώρας κατά τα παλαιολόγια χρόνια αποτελούσαν οπωσδήποτε τα βιβλία του Θεοδόρου Μετοχήτη και ενδεχομένως και του Νικηφόρου Γρηγορά αργότερα. Σύμφωνα με την προσωπική μαρτυρία του μεγάλου λογοθέτη σε δύο κείμενα που απίφθηνα από την εξορία στον ηγούμενο της χώρας και στον Γρηγορά αντίστοιχα τα πολυάριθμα και ποικίλα βιβλία τα πολυάριθμα και ποικίλα βιβλία του εναποτέθηκαν στη Μονή αρχικά για φύλαξη. Όπως φυλάσει τέμι τα ταμιεία του καλής του πλούτου, των πολυτιμή των βίβλων, εν ασφαλή και άσυλα, πάσης επηρείας ανώτεράτε και κρίτο. Και χώρατε μη γένε άσυλος αμφίτε και έσα με δαπείς. Στη συνέχεια ενσωματώθηκαν προφανώς στη βιβλιοθήκη της με τον εμπλουτισμό της οποίας άλλος το μετοχή τη είχε ασχοληθεί επισταμένος κατά την περίοδο της ανακαίνισης της Μονής μέσα από την απόκτηση και την αντιγραφή χειρογράφων. Δινός λογοτέχνης, εξαιρετικής μόρφωσης και πολυγραφότατος ρήτορας, ο Θεόδωρος μετοχή τη ασχολήθηκε και πειραματίστηκε με πολλά γραμματιακά είδη, μεταξύ των οποίων και με τη ρητορική έκφραση τον περιγραφικό λόγο που φέρει ζωντανά ενώπιον των οφθαλμών την εξωτερική όψη ενός αντικειμένου. Εκφρασίσεστη, λόγος περιηγηματικός, εναργός υπόψην άγων το δηλούμενον. Η τοποθέτηση της οποίας, της έκφρασης δηλαδή, στις τελευταίες θέσεις του σταθερά δομημένου συστήματος ασκήσεων των συλλογών προγυμνασμάτων, αποδεικνύει ξεκάθαρα τον απαιτητικό χαρακτήρα της. Με την πάροδο των αιώνων άλλωστε, οι συγγραφείς ανοίγαγαν ουσιαστικά την έκφραση σε ιδιαίτερο λογοτεχνικό είδος που είχε τους δικούς του κανόνες και τις δικές του αρχές. Ακόμη και όταν οι περιγραφές ήταν ένθετες 
σε άλλου είδου κείμενα, στοχεύοντα ξεκάθαρα σε ένα υψηλότερο υφολογικό επίπεδο και σε μια ξεχωριστή αισθητική γενικότερα. Και υπηρετώντα όχι μόνο τον εξοραϊσμό του κειμένου μέσω τη ρητορική τέχνη, αλλά ακόμη την αφηγηματική δομή και το ιδεολογικό του μήνυμα. Μέσα σε ένα τέτοιο πλαίσιο, ο Θεόδωρος Μετοχίτη συνέγραψε δύο από τις σημαντικότερες αυτοτελείς εκφράσεις της παλαιολόγιας εποχής, τον Νικαέα και των Βυζάντιων, τις εγκομιαστικές δηλαδή περιγραφές της Νίκαιας και της Κωνσταντινούπολης. Ωστόσο, και στο γνωστό του πείμα «Δοξολογία εις Θεών» και περί των χαρίτων, των καθαυτών και της μονής της χώρας, το οποίο σύμφωνα και με τον τίτλο του αποτελεί μια δοξολογία του συγγραφέα προς το Θεό για όσα του έχει χαρίσει στη ζωή του, ο μετοχήτης εμφέτει και μια έκφραση του alter ego του, της μονής της χώρας, την οποία όπως αναφέρει χαρακτηριστικά, μπορείτε να δείτε και το κείμενο, ανέλαβε να αναγεννήσει με δικά του έξοδα, ύστερα από συνεννόηση με τον αυτοκράτορα. Οι επενετικές αναφορές στον Ανδρόνικο Δεύτερο, σε συνδυασμό με το γεγονός ότι οι εργασίες της ανακαίνησης ολοκληρώθηκαν περίπου το 1321, επιτρέπουν τη χρονολόγηση της συγγραφή του ποίηματος στο αμέσως επόμενο χρονικό διάστημα και σίγουρα πριν από το 1328. Σύμφωνα με το κείμενο, η οικοδόμηση της Μονής ήταν απαράμιλη, καθώς χρησιμοποιήθηκαν τα καλύτερα και ακριβότερα υλικά. Οι τείχοι διακοσμήθηκαν επιμελώς με μάρμαρο και άλλες εξαιρετικές πολύχρωμες πέτρες, έτσι ώστε να μπορεί κανείς να παρατηρήσει όλα τα είδη των χρωμάτων που αντανακλώνταν από το φως, συνδυάζονταν όμορφα μεταξύ τους και συνέβαλαν στην ομορφιά ολόκληρου του κτίσματος. Όπως αναφέρεται επίσης χαρακτηριστικά, η οροφή της Μονής ήταν επενδυμένη με χρυσό και διακοσμημένη με όμορφα, φωτεινά ψηφιδωτά, εκθαμβωτικά για τα μάτια των θεατών, σαν μια λαμπερή φωτιά, όπως λέει. Ίδιας ποιότητας ήταν και τα πολυάριθμα κτίρια που κατασκευάστηκαν με εξαίρετο και περίτεχνο τρόπο μπροστά από τον κύριο ναό ή και γύρω από αυτόν. Ο μετοχήτης αναφέρει επίσης πως συνέλεξε κάθε είδους πολύτιμα χρυσά και ασημένια λειτουργικά κοιμήλια και τα αφιέρωσε στο ναό ώστε να χρησιμοποιούνται για τη Θεία Ευχαριστία. Η ποικιλία τους ήταν μεγάλη και όλα ήταν εξίσου πολύτιμα και όμορφα με αποτέλεσμα να δημιουργείται ένα αίσθημα πλούτου ικανοποίηση και σεβασμού στις καρδιές όσων τα έβλεπαν. Ο συγγραφέας επισημαίνει επίσης πως πρόσφερε στη Μονή πολλά πολύτιμα έπιπλα, υφάσματα και ενδύματα, όλα χρυσά, πολύχρωμα, όμορφα και ταιριαστά, κατάλληλα για τις ανάγκες του μοναστηριού. Άλλα ήταν υφασμένα με χρυσό και άλλα χρυσοκέντητα. Όλα κατασκευασμένα από τους καλύτερους και πιο φημισμένους τεχνίτες της εποχής. Όσον αφορά τα μεταξωτά ενδύματα, λειτουργικά ή όχι, ήταν κατασκευασμένα επιδέξια και συνδυασμένα επίσης με χρυσό, έτσι ώστε να είναι ακόμη πιο όμορφα, εκπέμποντας την ανυπέρβλητη λάμψη τους. Ολοκληρώνοντας την ένθετη έκφρασή του, ο μετοχήτης περιγράφει ακόμη τις εικονογραφικές αναπαραστάσεις που χάρισε στη Μονή. Επρόκειτο για εικόνες με παραστάσεις της ανθρώπινης φύσης του Ιησού. Από τη γέννηση, τη ζωή του επιγής, τη σύλληψη, το μαρτύριο, τον θάνατο και την Ανάστασή του. Για να απεικονιστούν όλα αυτές εικόνες, καταβλήθηκαν, όπως αναφέρεται, μεγάλες προσπάθειες από ζωγράφους. Δεδομένου μάλιστα ότι υπήρχαν και άλλες ιερές εικόνες του Χριστού, της Παναγίας και των Αγίων, οι οποίες διακοσμήθηκαν πολυτελώς με χρυσό, ασίμι, μαργαριτάρια και πολύτιμους λίθους. Η έκφραση, αν και ευσύνοπτη, προσφέρει μία συνολική 
και λαμπερή εικόνα της μονής της χώρας. Έτσι τουλάχιστον όπως αυτή ήταν μετά από την ανακαίνισή της. Εν τούτης, η επιμονή του συγγραφέα κατά την περιγραφή στα υλικά που χρησιμοποιήθηκαν και εξασφαλίστηκαν με δικά του έξοδα στον πλούτο των λειτουργικών κοιμηλίων και κυρίως στα πολύτιμα μέταλλα που κοσμούσαν αντικείμενα, υφάσματα και εικονογραφικές αναπαραστάσεις αποσκοπεί μάλλον στην ισχυροποίηση της δικής του θέσης και συνακόλουθα του Ανδρονίκου Δευτέρου έναντι τόσο της θεϊκής εξουσίας που δηλώνεται με τη λέξη δοξολογία του τίτλου του ποίηματος όσο και της βασιλικής εξουσίας σε μια δύσκολη περίοδο εμφύλιων διαμαχών που ταλαιπώρησαν για μεγάλο χρονικό διάστημα την πολιτική ζωή της πρωτεύουσα και της αυτοκρατορίας γενικότερα. Σε κάθε περίπτωση είναι σαφές ότι ο Θεόδωρος Μετοχήτης με το ποιητικό του πόνημα προσπαθεί μέσω του λόγου του και της ρητορικότητά του να αναδείξει την τέχνη και την τεχνική δεξιότητα του σοφού κατασκευαστή και με ιδιαίτερα εναργή και ζωντανό τρόπο να θέσει ενώπιον των οφθαλμών όχι μόνο την εξωτερική αλλά και την εσωτερική όψη ενός σπουδαίου αρχιτεκτονήματος και μιας υπέρλαμπρης εκκλησίας που χάρη στον ίδιο αναγεννήθηκε. Σε ένα δεύτερο όμως κατορθώνει επίσης να αντιπαρατεθεί με εύσχυμο τρόπο στην ύλη, αναδεικνύοντας το ρόλο της ως ενός απλού μέσου και μόνο, χάρη στο οποίο μπορούν να επιτευχθούν πνευματικές κατακτήσεις. Με αυτόν τον τρόπο όμως αναδεικνύεται σε έναν, αν όχι τον μοναδικό, από τους λίγους συγγραφείς της παλαιολόγιας εποχής, που ακολουθώντας την προγενέστερη παράδοση, συνεχίζει να δίνει, έστω και έμεσα, έμφαση στη ματαιότητα της οικαστικής τέχνης και στην ανωτερότητα του λόγου και να αναγνωρίζει ότι μόνο αυτός μπορεί τελικά να διασώσει αιώνια πρωτίστως στην ανθρώπινη φαντασία μια υψηλής αισθητικής καλλιτεχνική δημιουργία. Ευχαριστώ πολύ. We thank you, uh, Professor Taxidis, uh, for uh, your uh, contribution uh, to our symposium. It was indeed uh, a very uh, informative, thorough view of uh, the matter of uh, all uh, Metohitis' uh, efforts uh, um, for uh, this magnificent uh, monument, uh, the, uh, also the um, artistic characteristic of this uh, magnificent, unique monument. Um, it was really a valuable insight into the subject. Thank you very much. And uh, now uh, I would like uh, to yield the floor to Mr. Kostis Mirlis, uh, researcher of uh, the Institute of uh, Historical uh, um, Research of National Hellenic Research Foundation to give uh, uh, his speech entitled Redating the refoundation of uh, the Hora by Theodore Metochitis, circa 1310 to 1315. Thank you very much, for the invitation. Θα προσθέσω και εγώ ένα, ορισμένα ρί. Είναι rediscovering, I will add a few ρίς. Uh, redating the refoundation of the Hora by Theodore Metochitis um, to this period, around 1310 to around 1315. Um, so my, my purpose today is, is, is rather modest. I just want to present some evidence that allow us to uh, redate the career of Theodore Metochitis and which in turn um, provides a new date for the completion of the work at the Hora. Um, so this will be the main uh, part of my talk. Uh, I will also at the end uh, propose a chronology for the construction work at the Hora, the start and the conclusion. So the, first of all, on, on uh, Theodore Metochitis' career, 
Um, so uh, first of all, there is a, the, the traditional chronology of uh, his uh, um, uh, progress in uh, in uh, uh, he, the progress of his dignities. Uh, he was uh, around 1290. Uh, he was first appointed Logothetis uh, Tonagelon. Sometime between 1295 and 1305, he was promoted Logothetis Tonikiakon. Around 1305 or 1306, he was promoted Logothetis uh, to Yeniku. And in the spring uh, of 1321, he, he was promoted Megas Logothetis. Um, this is what uh, we, we thought until uh, recently. Um, and um, the, the epigraphic, uh, this, uh, abundant epigraphic evidence uh, coming from the monument, the Hora, um, that shows that the foundation was completed while uh, Theodor Matohidis held the dignity of Logothetis to Genicu. Um, first of all, outside, I'm showing you a, a rather bad picture of uh, um, uh, of a part of the west of the Belfry base uh, on the west uh, facade of the building, which reads uh, Logothetis and uh, uh, from the In the interior, there's pl plenty of evidence in the interior as well. So there's a uh, Logothetis, uh, uh, so um, Octitor, Theodoros, Logothetis, Metochitis. Um, uh, not necessarily in this order, and um, again, uh, logothe just logothetis. Uh, in the uh, in the uh, at the at the base of the dome uh, in the naos, uh, there are four monograms. One of which reads logothetis, not not the one I'm showing. The one I'm showing is the east, of course, Theodore. But I couldn't find the um, the southern side, which has uh, this monogram, which reads again Logothetis. Um, and of course, the donor's portrait um, above the entrance to the Neos, um, which has this inscription: uh, uh, Octitor Logothetis to Genicu Theodore Somatochitis. So. The, according to the, so basically, certainly the, uh, the Hora was completed, both the buildings and the decoration, uh, before, while he was, before, uh, while, while Theodore, Theodore Metohidi was, was um, Logothetis to Yeniku. And um, so, according to the traditional chronology, before the spring of 1321. <laughs> Because then, at that point, he was promoted Megas Logothetis, which, of course, he would have uh, noted in, in, the, in his building. Um, so um, I'm coming now to the evidence that allows to redate the career of Theodor Metogidis. Uh, it's, it's a document preserved by the cartulary of the monastery of uh, the Prodromos, the monastery of Prodromos near Ceres. So a cartulary is basically is a codex on which um, various documents of uh, an individual or a monastery are copied. In this case, um, the, the cartulary of the Prodromos uh, contains more than 200 uh, documents uh, dating from the middle of the 13th to the middle of the 14th century, uh, and uh, which, uh, which is the moment when they, they were uh, copied on the codex. Um, this is the, the Prodromos uh, Monastery, uh, just to the north of Ceres, on, the, on Mount Menikion. Um, so, um, the, 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 this, this, this uh, actually has been edited in 1998 by Elisa Benu, uh, the Codex B of the, of the monastery. And um, what interests us here is, not, is uh, document number 34. Um, which is an act of sale by which uh, Manuel de Candilis and his family sell a land of theirs located near Ceres to Theodore Metohidis. And from other documents of the Prodromos, we know that Metohidis owned a large estate in, the, in that area and uh, that he was acquiring additional lands there. 
Most interesting, of, uh, however, is the fact that the act uh, is dated April 1317, and that Metochidis is called in the uh, document Megas Logothetis. Uh, and this is the, um, I'm just showing you the picture and the um, relevant, uh, uh, sorry, part. Um, here is the uh, Proceton Afthendin ke Kyrion mi ton Peripothiton Sympetheron to Krateu ke Agiu imon Afthendu ke Vasileos Megalon, Megan, uh, Logothetin Kyr Theodoron ton Metochitin. Uh, so this is the, the part of the, of the act of sale uh, where the, this, uh, the vendor addresses the, uh, the one who uh, acquires. Um, and uh, uh, the other interesting part is the date of the document, uh, which is in a damaged part, so which was only partly read by the editor. Uh, the editor could only read the year. Uh, but thanks to UV pictures, um, we can see the, the entire uh, date. Uh, so it's a graphite after the Emi Hiri Theodoru Iereos, Ipomimniscondos, Ke Ta Vulariu, Tisagiota, Tis Metropolio Seron, Tu Aploravdi Mini Aprilio, Indictionos, the Catis Pemptis. Two exactly two octacosios two cos two pem two etus. So um, this is the date. Uh, the indiction corresponds perfectly well to the year of the creation, six thousand eight hundred twenty-five. Um, so uh, we can be pretty sure that this is a, the copist copied correct what he was saying. Um, And this is, of course, uh, safely in uh, April 1317. So, um, which, of course, uh, creates a problem with the traditional uh, chronology, which has to be revised. Um, is a new chronology has to be, uh, um, is now, uh, has to be accepted. So, um, Theodore Metochidis must have been promoted to Megas Logothetis between, uh, before April 1317, and uh, most likely after the end of 1313, uh, when uh, it, uh, he appears to have still held the dignity of um, Logothetis to Genicu. So, as I noted, this has implications for the Monastery of Hora, but before I go there, um, um, I just wanted to discuss the, um, the basis uh, of the traditional chronology. So it's the basis of this chronology is entirely what Nikiforos Grigoras says in his history. So Nikiforos Grigoras was another scholar of the time, younger than Metochidis. In fact, he was his student, and also not only his student, uh, his protege, a friend of his, and somebody who actually was live, uh, came to live uh, in the Hora. So it was somebody close to Metochidis and a priori somebody who knew very well uh, what he was talking about, um, especially with regard to Metochidis. So in uh, his history, uh, the elements that concern us here, uh, in book uh, seven of the history, in the part covering the years 1310 to 1318, uh, Metochitz appears once uh, as Logothetis to Geniku in an excursus regarding that person uh, which is placed between the events of 1313 13 and 1317. And uh, in the entire book, there is no mention, in the, or in the entire period, no mention of the restoration of the Hora. In book eight, uh, Metochitis reappears, again as Logothetis to Geniku, in passages referring to March 1321. Then in a passage following events of June 1321, Grigoras calls Metochitis Megas Logothetis, explaining that he had already obtained this dignity. So uh, everybody has concluded from this uh, evidence um, that Metochitis was promoted Megas Logothetis between March and June 1321. 
Another passage of uh, Grigoras uh, regards the Hora. I mean, one of these passages actually regards the Hora, uh, which uh, it's a passage that uh, is uh, relates to an event of early March 1321, uh, in which Grigoras refers to the restoration of the Hora. So he says, the Logothetis to Genigu, uh, Theodore Mdohidis, had finished re renovating the monastery of the Hora, its internal decoration. So, ο Μέντι λογοθέτης του γενικού άρτη του νεοργή είναι πέπαυτο την της χώρας μονήν, όπως ο Σωενήντων ετύχανε κόσμος. So, the, ho the conclusion, the χώρα was completed soon before March 1321. So, of course, this contradicts um, squarely the, or seems to contradict squarely the uh, evidence of the document. of the prodromos, which I ju just presented. So how is the evidence of Rivaras to be explained? Um, the fact that book seven does not mention Metohitis' promotion to Megas Logothetis or his restoration of the Hora is, is quite easy to explain. Uh, book seven is uh, extremely brief and very selective. The nine years, 1310, 1318, occupy in Bond's edition approximately 25 pages. And uh, there are less uh, uh, there are less than a dozen separate stories in those 25 pages. It's really um, minimal for such a long period. Uh, so we, it's very it's, it's, it's no surprise that there's no mention of Metohis or the monastery. Um, the second uh, point, the title Grigoras gives Metohitis in passages referring to spring of 1321 can be attributed to carelessness. Uh, in fact, it was, uh, often, uh, was often caught confusing dates and dignities. Um, for example, uh, the dignities he attributes to Theodore Metochidis and John Glickis during their embassy to Cyprus and Cilicia are no doubt wrong. Uh, regarding an event of 1321, Rigoras states that he was 27 years old, so born around 1294. While concerning events of 1351, he gives the age of 60 years or so, born around 1291. And there are many other problematic uh, passages, um, suspicious passages of Grigoras. Um, we don't know when he wrote exactly in which part of the history. Certainly, um, uh, in the 30s, late 30s or even later. Uh, um, he didn't remember, he had bad notes, um, he didn't care enough. It doesn't matter. The matter is, the, what, what seems to be the case is that uh, he cannot be trusted uh, on many, many occasions. Um, and I uh, may add here that um, uh, this, this um, uh, mention of Metohitis as uh, you know, the restoration of the Horat comes right after uh, a book which was extremely um, brief, uh, book seven, whereas book, from book eight, Grigoras um, uh, starts being much more detailed. So uh, there he can say many more things. And so uh, he's uh, talking about Metohidis and the Hora. Um, the, as for the expression, O Mendi Logothetis to Genicu Arti to Neorgine Pepafto Tintis Horas Monin, the, the meaning of this is ambiguous, and, and, and its translation depends on how one understands Arti. You can, one can either translate it, he had recently finished renovating, as most people or all people have done until now, or simply he had finished renovating, as I suggest we should do, um, because Rigoras uses Arti, of course, in its classical meaning to say recently or now, but he also uses it as a connective or intensive partic particle, frequently in constructions with circumstantial participles and at least once with pluperfect, as is the, also the case in this passage. Uh, so this type of RT does not have to be translated. Um, The conferral of the dignity of Megas Logothetis to Metohitis before 1317 um, resolves a number of difficulties. First of all, 
the, the fact that, um, I mean, we, don't, we no longer have to puzzle why the man who became one of the emperor's closest associates uh, at latest in the early 1310s um, kept the relatively low rank of Leothetis to Geniku, number 23 in the hierarchy, until uh, 1321. And um, also, there's now no problem with the letter of Theodore Hirtakinos indicating that Metochidis was Megas Logothetis before 1319. Uh, finally, the statement of Grigoras, who was born around 1293, as I will uh, say sh shortly, um, that he joined the Hora as a child. Uh, while Metochidis was restoring it, um, is no longer difficult because this, if we accepted this, uh, that, that the work um, only finished in 1321, this statement would imply that the restoration lasted 10 years at least, um, which is not impossible, but it's a bit too long. Um, so now coming to the Hora. Um, the, and it's uh, the redating of its refoundation. So practically all publications and the, the, the regarding the Hora adopt the dates 1316, 1321 for the start and completion of the project. And um, this, they basically follow Shevchenko, uh, Shevchenko's article uh, of 1975, where he said, uh, he suggested that the work likely started around um, 1316, and in any case, not before 1312. And the reason he says that is, uh, is this is based on, or, uh, on, on no, uh, no solid evidence, what uh, Shevchenko says, um, these dates. But it has been accepted uh, by everybody. Um, so now we really have to change those dates, uh, because um, we know for sure that it had, must have finished before April 1317, because at that time, Metochidis was already Logothetis, Megas Logothetis, and certainly after th around 1305, 1306, when he became Logothetis to Yeniku. Um, so uh, I will finish uh, by a few words on uh, I thoughts about uh, the period, the likely period of construction work at the Hora, which I suggest is uh, around 1310 to around 1315. Uh, first of all, there's the evidence of Grigoras. Uh, he said, uh, he says, he settled in the Hora at the instigation of Metohitis. He was then very young, a child. And uh, he contributed to Metohitis' foundation of the Hora from the beginning. These are statements that uh, Shevchenko doesn't really discuss. Um, so, uh, Hans Veit uh, Bayer has shown convincingly that Grigoras must have been born around 1293. Um, so, uh, if we accept what Grigoras says again, um, uh, the project must have started sometimes between 1308 and 1312, or around 1310, uh, at the time when Grigoras was very young. So, 15 and up to 19 years old, I guess 19 is the latest you, one can claim to be a child, perhaps too late. Um, but he was already, he was very young, but already capable of offering help. Um, um, independently of what, uh, Ras, um, of what Grigoras says, uh, around 1310 is the most plausible date for the project's start. Uh, it allows some time after 1305, when Metochitis, uh, it's a year Metochitis returned from Thessaloniki to Constantinople and was promoted to Logothetis to Yeniku soon after, for him to become sufficiently wealthy and establish in the hierarchy to undertake the task. And it gives enough time before April 1317 for the completion of a project that must have required several years of work. Uh, and let me add at the end that um, Robert Osterhout has proposed a close relationship between the core additions, um, so the buildings, and the Paraclesion of the Pamakaristos, that is dated to, to around 1310, arguing that they were probably built by the same workshop. 
Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Smirlis, for your presentation. It was indeed uh, very interesting, your proposal, based on thorough study of the written sources. It is uh, a general consensus that the issue of the chronology of the construction of uh, the Hora is uh, instrumental. Uh, so we can move on. The next contribution to our conference will be made by Emeritus Professor of the Department of History of Art of the University of Pennsylvania, Robert Oesterhout, whom I invite to deliver his speech entitled X-ray vision at the Hora Monastery. Thank you, can you hear me? Yes, of course, we can okay. hear you. Um, uh, thank you very much for the invitation to participate in this symposium, and I'm very, very sorry that I cannot be there in person. So let me begin. The recent installation of curtains at the Carrier Museum in expectation of its conversion to a mosque has upset almost everyone, blocking a full uh, appreciation of the building's three-dimensional program of figural de uh, decoration, uh, what sometimes has been called icons in space. So should this mean that it's curtains for the Quora? And let me explain, this is American slang from gangster films of the 20th century. I think it was Edward G. Robinson who first uttered the immortal words, it's curtains for you. Um, before killing a rival mob boss. So is it curtains for the Quora? Or is this a version of cancel culture like that at Ravenna where images of Theodoric and members of his Gothic court were eliminated and replaced by curtains? Now, as I commented years ago, what we see at the Quora is not so much a decorative program set into an architectural space, but an architectural space that has become an integral part of its decoration. In the complex and intelligent program of the Quora, images relate to one another across time and space. For example, the image of the Vlacherni Tisa at the entrance, the Theotogos is inscribed container of the uncontainable, a common epithet and a play on the name of the monastery. Her placement above the entrance situates her opposite prominent image of images of containers, amphoras of wine in the wedding at Cana and baskets of bread in the miracle of the loaves. Continuing the axis eastwards leads us to the bima where the bread and wine were offered at the Eucharist. Turning the other direction, the view out the door beneath the image would have led to the monastery dedicated to the Theotokos and beyond that to the land walls container of the city divinely protected by her. The spatial interactions throughout tell a rich and multi-layered story amplified by their architectural setting both within the building and without. Now, what I'd like to do today is take a slightly different approach as my paper's title, my paper's title suggests. What could we learn from the building if we had X-ray vision? That is, if we could see not just through those invasive curtains, but also through the walls. I shall argue that meaningful relationships extend beyond the individual spaces even beyond the obvious sight lines, and that the architectural framework plays a critical role in how we read the meaning of the decorative program. My starting point for today's inquiry is windows. This might seem obvious for there are a lot of windows at the Quora, which surprisingly, most scholars have not looked into. And here I refer to the internal windows. I discussed several of these in my 1986 book, but I'd like to update my analysis here. 
For example, an internal window designed from the beginning was incorporated into the narrative program of Herod ordering the massacre of the innocents. Indeed, one of the soldiers appears to turn to look into it as he searches for the children of Israel. This particular window opens into the spiral staircase that originally led to the belfry, accessed through a door at floor level. I um, follow uh, the suggestion of Ernest Hawkins that the window would have allowed the bell ringer uh, to see the start of the liturgical procession in the exonarthex and to ring the bells at the appropriate moment. Otherwise, how could he have known? I also wonder occasionally if there was a special meaning um, having the window in the midst of the massacre of the innocents, such as if the tolling of bells became associated with the funeral service, could they also be tolling for the innocents? Our host, uh, Thanasis uh, Simoglu, has proposed a connection between the massacred innocents and Theodore Medicides Library, since he refers to his books as uh, his children and worries about their preservation during his exile. It's a nice conceit, um, but on this basis, he suggests the library may have been situated in the now lost Belfry, although I believe it um, must have been elsewhere. A second internal window opens from the uh, uh, upper north annex into the nows, uh, the decoration around it now lost. From this, uh, the position and details of the upper chamber, I argue that it functioned as a study or library of the founder, Theodore Metahedes, and would have allowed him to oversee um, and overhear the um, liturgical services in the nows from a place of seclusion. It's more accessible and more appropriately located than the Belfry. Uh, an elevated private space for the founder is something we find in a variety of other locations, um, usually overlooking the Nows. And I think it makes perfectly good sense uh, here. Now, there are other openings as well connected to spaces whose functions are more difficult to interpret. On the south wall of the Naus is another internal window restored on good evidence in the 1950s, which connects to a rectangular chamber accessible from an internal passageway. While carefully constructed, the chamber is undecorated and its function unclear but because it was uniquely situated between the Naus and the tomb of Theodore Medichides, Underwood has suggested that it might have been a small chapel or oratory in which icons with perpetually burning uh, candles and votive lamps might be kept and commemorative rites have been performed. It might also have been a monk's cell for private meditation, for its occupant could see and hear the services in the nows, but its relationship to the founder's tomb is certainly worth considering. Was the space um, intended for a monk charged to, play for the, uh, to pray for the salvation of the founder's soul, or perhaps a special place of medica uh, meditation for Theodore Medichides himself during his lifetime to contemplate his own mortality, situated between life and the nows and death, his tomb. Before turning to the uh, internal windows in the Paraclesion, let me look briefly at the windows uh, in the connecting passageway. The door opening into the Paraclesion originally was topped by a transparent lunette. It's glazing now lost. Um, as is evident from the surviving frame. What did the window look like? Fortunately, um, the doorway opposite it, leading into the nows, is topped by a false window, um, executed in paint with a central oculus flanked by partial oculi. While we can't see through this window, it no doubt replicates the one opposite it. When we turn to the Paraclesion itself, there are two more internal windows uh, to consider. The most significant, significant of these opens just above the tomb of Theodore Medichides into a curious irregular space 
where the 14th century editions intersect the 11th and 12th century nows. My initial reading of this space was purely pragmatic, again, following the opinion of uh, Ernest Hawkins, that it allowed ventilation for the Periclesian, which was otherwise closed. It also served to level the roof between the two parts of the complex. However, crawling into the space decades ago, um, I noted a graffito image of a monk scratched into the damp mortar. I couldn't find that uh, image, unfortunately, but it's on file at Dumbarton Oaks. Instead, you see me crawling into um, that space above the tomb. Uh, Anyway, I didn't think much of uh, the graffito at the time, but Pro Professor Churchich subsequently suggested to me that this space might have served as the cell of a hermit monk. Now, this suggestion is worth considering for several reasons. Um, first, um, the window uh, opening into the space is carefully positioned symmetrically in the lunette. That is, its form and location were sensibly considered architecturally. Second, and more important, the space is directly above the tomb of Theodore Menachides. Um, and third, might we consider how this window and the space behind it relate to the iconographic program of the Paraclesion, significantly to the scene of Jacob's Ladder, which frames it with its uniquely curving staircase. Now elsewhere, I have discussed the thematic relationship of the painted decoration here to the founder's tomb. Jacob's ladder was seen as a type of the version forming a bridge between this world and the next from death to eternal life. This is emphasized in the pendentive next to it where the hymnographer Theophanes Graptos is depicted composing a hymn to the Theotokos. He writes, we have turned back to the earth because we have sin sin sinned against the commandments of God. But through thee, O Virgin, we have it, ascended from the earth, shaking off the corruption of death. Uh, Theophanes pauses in his writing and with his pen directs our gaze toward the ladder and to the founder's tomb beneath it. Taken together, the visual program offers the promise of salvation to the founder. Well, should we consider the window behind it as part of this program? Uh, the window and the space behind it as part of this program. Perhaps uh, the presence of an angelic monk assigned to pray for the soul of the founders um, would have offered another intermediary between the founders' mortal remains and his heavenly salvation. Why else would the uh, lead angel on the ladder gesture both to the Theotokos as queen of heaven and to the window immediately below her. A second passage, a second window is more puzzling. This opens into a chamber on the other side of the passageway. Um, its floor level is raised above the stub of a 12th century wall and evidence of several phases remains exposed in the walls of this room, which was never plastered or finished in any way. Um, initially, I dismissed it as a storeroom, but the internal window remains a puzzle. Would an unfinished storeroom deserve such elegant ventilation particularly as the window interrupts the parade of saints. I suspect this may have been another cell for a hermit and its placement immediately next to the unusual representation of the dendrite, David of Thessaloniki. Um, um, may encourage a hermetic occupant to that space. Indeed, for both internal windows of the Periclesion, the architectural placement and intersection with the decorative program suggests they were more than just openings for ventilation. Taken together, uh, the three rooms just discussed physically envelop the tomb of the founder behind, above, and beside. Could they have been intended to surround the tomb spiritually as well? as spaces housing special prayers 
for his salvation. Well, after this excursion of looking through windows, I'd like to now turn to the possibility of looking through masonry. For example, um, in the outer narthex, the depiction of the waiting at Cana um, and the pendentive immediately next to the monumental image of Christ of the Chora. Um, as I've discussed before, the most prominent element in the scene are the amphoras filled with water that Christ has just turned into wine. As Underwood and his team recognized in their study of the mosaics, the tesserae used to represent the amphoras are, uh, are in fact ceramic, broken pieces of pots. The images of amphoras are pieced together from broken amphora. Um, it's a bit meta, but I think we can look even deeper here. It was standard practice in Byzantine construction for the dead spaces behind pendentives um, to be filled with amphoras to lighten the load on the vaulting. Thus, where we see amphoras in the narrative, they are both made up of amphoras and reflect the placement of amphoras immured behind the masonry surface. I'm not sure if we should read uh, any special meaning here beyond coincidence, but perhaps this could have been simply a reiteration of the meaning of the name of the monastery, Chora as container, an idea quite literally embedded in its walls. Finally, a view through the walls might aid in the interpretation of one of the puzzling irregularities of the building. The northern entrance from the inner narthex into the naus has no symmetrical counterpart, which would have been in the area where the great deus's mosaic now appears. Was there a special function or meaning to this north entrance? Well, the archeological investigations of the 1950s encouraged a reconstruction of the 11th century Cora with three entrances into the naus. These were blocked in the 12th century reconstruction when the um, piers were added in the corners of the naus. It's unclear if uh, that second Middle Byzantine phase, if the church had one, two, or uh, three entrances into the naus, but I suspect it probably had only one. So the present Northern door is a product of Theodore Metahedes reconstruction. And it's nicely outfitted with marble door frames and its reveals are covered with spoliated false door panels. These panels surely had a special meaning in their present context as they represent the life and miracles of Christ. Now I'm reminded how doors can take on a special significance in Byzantine thought. Psalm 23, seven often cited reads, Lift up your gates, ye princes, and be ye lifted up, ye everlasting doors, and the king of glory shall come in. John 10, 9, emphasizing that the entrance to eternal life is closed to the unbeliever, quotes Christ as saying, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The false doors here emphasize that the door is open for the entry of Christ and for those who are saved. Moreover, a view through the door um, looks directly to the proskinitarian icon of Christ flanking the bema. Unusually, the text held by Christ does not refer to the dedication of the church or monastery, as do other iconic images elsewhere in the building. It contains instead words from the funerary liturgy. Come unto me, ye who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. From Matthew eleven twenty eight, The message complements that from John 10, 9. Christ is the door to salvation. Well, the idea of Christ as the open door gains meaning as we turned to the deusis mosaic in the south bay of the inner narthex. If we would attempt to construct a symmetrical door to the naus to match that of the north door, it would go right through the image of the Theotokos. In fact, the figures in the mosaic 
are shifted to the left to put her in that position. Here, I would like to conjure the popular type of the Theotokos as the closed door, as appears, for example, um, in the wall painting in the ambulatory of the Pamacaristos and um, elsewhere in scenes at the Quora. The image is based on Ezekiel um, 44.2. This gate shall be shut and it shall not be open and no man shall enter by it because the Lord, the God of Israel has entered by it therefore it shall be shut. Well, if we turn on our X-ray vision and look through the closed door, it frames the image toward the proskinitarian icon of the Theotokos Eleusa. She is identified by inscription as she is elsewhere in the church as the container of the uncontainable, again, complementing the meaning of the closed door. The Kura and church and monastery were, of course, dedicated collectively to the Theotokos in Christ, as Theodore Medichides' poems emphasize. That dedication is reflected in pendant images of Christ and his mother throughout the building. At the entrance to the nows, I would argue, is another set of pendant images of the two, but here they are represented in architectural terms. Christ as the open door, and the Theotokos as the closed door. To conclude, you may well ask, am I just playing mind games? I think not. The coherence of the Quora as a Gesamtkunstwerk suggests a unity in the direction of the project from start to finish. That is, the church was both built and decorated under the direction of either the knowledgeable and involved patron Theodore Medichides, or a master, ma uh, master artisan who shared his vision. Whoever determined the pictorial program knew the building inside and out, its eccentric spaces and its rich history. They also knew what lay behind the decorated surfaces, even deep within its walls. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Osterhout, for your uh, very interesting uh, and enlightening uh, speech, which gave us the opportunity to understand uh, unknown aspects of uh, the architecture, of the organization of the, and the meaning, the symbolism of the inner uh, space and uh, of the decoration of that uh, exquisite monument. Uh, your conclusions, uh, as you know, of course, of, of your speech, of, as you know, of course, were very significant uh, for scientific research. We thank you again. Um, I would like uh, now to welcome Professor Alexei Lidov uh, of the Lomonosov Moscow State University and the Russian Academy of Arts, and ask him to give his speech, which is entitled Christ Hora. Theotokos Hora, Church Hora, the Byzantine concept of iconicity and the notion of Hora. First of all, I would like to thank the organizers for the invitation. It's always a big pleasure to be in essence again, and especially among the company of my beloved friends. And I also would like to say and to remember now that uh, I I mean, your European Center for Byzantine and Post-Byzantine Antiquities um, was created 
uh, in, well, partly with my participation and with my belated friends, uh, Professor Slobodan Churchic and his wife, Yevtalia um, Hajetrifanos. And I just would like to remember their efforts are uh, so important for continuation of the life, for the creation and, and the life of this center. Yes, well, we know that most probably the program of Korea Jami or Hora Monastery, I mean iconographic program, was created by Fyodor Mitahitas as who actually um, created the architectural space and rebuilt this church. And again, most probably, he was responsible for, for the name of this renovated complex, I mean, which was called Hora. Up to present moment in guidebooks and even some studies, we may find the so-called topographical explanation of this name, and uh, which usually uh, translated as land, village, which appeared at the end, um, at the Mm, edge of, of, of the city, nearby the city walls, and so on. Well, it seems that this explanation is totally wrong, and uh, this name was a, a part of the concept by Theodor Mitahitas, and the name is, I, I will try to show, is comparable with the divine names like Hagia Sophia or Hagia Irini and some others. Uh, and uh, in this church, in this program, Fyodor Metahitis gives us a key for such understanding of the sacred space of uh, uh, Kare Jami. And uh, first of all, a sequence of images inscribed horror. I, I'm going to remind you uh, these um, examples. Uh, first of all, we see the first image inscribed Jesus Christ uh, Horaton Zonton, or Space of Living, uh, just in the uh, first narthex and above the main entrance to the church. And the next one, at the following entrance uh, in the inner narthex, with this famous composition uh, with Fyodor Metahitis in front of the uh, of Christ enthroned, uh, most probably with the reference to the famous mosaic above the entrance to Hagia Sophia in Constantinople. And again, we see the same inscription, Jesus Christ, Hora Tonzonton. And one more image one may find again in the inner nertex, in its northern part, northern wall, and with combination of two images, the Virgin Orange and 
the image of Christ, which mostly did not survive, but we see the remains of the inscription with, you know, familiar combination of words, means horror to uh, Zonton, space of living for the image of uh, blessing Christ, which we are not able to, to see now. And possibly the same inscription was uh, next to the image of Christ in, uh, in the Naus, flanking the original sanctuary barrier. And uh, uh, <coughs> displayed um, in combination with another image of the Virgin uh, inscribed Hora to Ahoritu. And we know two images like this. One um, meter to Hora to Ahoritu, which is presented at the entrance to the exonartex, just opposite the image of Christ, Horaton Zonton, and created with this image a kind of, uh, of a program. Uh, and uh, usually, as uh, Professor Oster Osterhut just said, he is translating it as a container of uncontainable. But I think maybe better to translate it as space of what exists beyond any space. Uh, and this is uh, another image with the same inscription, Hora to Ahoritu which is on the icon, Proscunius icon, flanking the uh, uh, sanctuary barrier of in, in the Naus. And uh, well, what actually was the concept by Fyodor Mitahites and why the notion of horror was so important for him. Mm. Uh, usually we translate in the most general way this term like uh, a, a space. And mm, it's correct, but we should remember that for the first time, this term and notion appeared in the Plato's dialogue, Timaeus, where Hora is called as one of three fundamental categories which appeared before any form and even before heavens. And uh, with the meaning of space, let us try to understand what um, Plato me meant and what was so important in this notion in Neoplatonism and later in Patristics um, and even in the polemics with iconoclasts uh, and how the theory of horror relates to the most famous Plato's theory of so-called Eidos. Uh, let us remember this logic. So uh, Plato suggested that there is a table, a concrete material particular table, which anybody may, may, may touch. And at the same time, there is the image idea of this table uh, in heavens. And what uh, horror meant in this uh, 
in this vision, in this uh, philosophical discourse, horror meant a space which actually unified, combined these two absolutely different thing, things, the material object and its ideal image, its aidus in heavens. And if we would apply this concept to Christian matters, we will see that horror is in presence in any Eucharistic sacrifice because there is an absolutely material um, uh, sacred sacraments uh, in, in, uh, uh, in flesh and, and, and bread and uh, flesh and um, uh, blood, so bread and wine. Uh, and at the same time, when we accept these sacraments, we, we received with them the second person of the Holy Trinity, eternally, uh, eternally existing in heavens. So, and if we will go further for the theory of icon veneration, we will see that what is actually differs the orthodox concept of icon veneration uh, and, and what actually uh, different uh, in this practice from the veneration of idols is this uh, spatial, nature, uh, spatial nature of, um, of the phenomenon. It means that any icon which is absolutely material which anybody can touch, can destroy, can kiss. Uh, at the same time, it's presenting a prototype um, already existing in heavens. And actually, horror, I mean, unifies these two absolutely different opposite uh, spaces uh, and existing beyond any uh, common rational logic. And so uh, this means that uh, Fyodor Mithahides wanted to, to, to remind about the basic principle of Byzantine iconicity, that to suggest that any icon as a mediating realm, which principally different from any flat picture or, or any religious picture, uh, well, uh, uh, is uh, any icon is horror. It means any icon is a spatial matter. Uh, and uh, on the screen, you may see not just the, the image of Fyodor Mitahitas, but a compartment of, of the Horo Monastery where this idea of spatial image is well presented. So we may uh, in conjunction with horror and its meaning, we may understand the concept of Fyodor Mitahitis, who wanted to emphasize the uh, major principle uh, of spatial icon. So the whole building with all its decoration uh, in uh, his mind was a spatial icon uh, and very much related to the uh, 
long Byzantine tradition of the creation of sacred spaces or spatial icons, and which recently uh, we are discussing in the context of um, new field of knowledge called hierotopy. So, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor Lidov, for your thought-provoking presentation. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Lidov, for your thought-provoking presentation and uh, the systematic approach of this theme. Uh, your valuable remarks and uh, analysis on the symbolic, uh, deep uh, philosophical meaning of the notion of horror and uh, the relationship with uh, Byzantine uh, iconicity was uh, valuable. Thank you very much, again. And uh, in this point, I would like uh, to inform all of you that uh, in our symposium, uh, 25 persons present in uh, the auditorium of the War Museum uh, participate, and also 93 other persons um, participate in our symposium electronically. Having heard all um, four presentations, the floor is now open for questions for the audience. Uh, we have half an hour at our disposal for discussion. Um, I would give uh, the speech um, to all um, um, uh, persons that uh, want to um, pose um, uh, an answer in the room or electronically. I can uh, have here, I, I read here your uh, electronic um, uh, ans um, questions. Sorry. So, um, if you have a question for our first uh, speaker, Professor Taxidis, please uh, raise your hand so they can see you. Do you have an, an answer, a question for Professor Taxidis, uh, who uh, has spoken to us about um, the, the ekphrasis of the Hora Monastery in Theodore Mitohitis' poem, Doxologia is Theon, και περί των χαρίτων, των καθαυτών και της μονής της χώρας. Έχουμε κάποια ερώτηση. Το Zoom πώς το βλέπω. Α, προφέσορ Στερχάουτ. Νο, νο. Μίστερ Νέλσον. Μίστερ Νέλσον. Θέλει να προσθέσει μια ερώτηση. I'm very sorry, but I, uh, I actually wanted to pose a question to the, uh, to the second paper. So please forgive my raised hand. I'll try to raise it at the right time. Thank you. Open your uh, microphone so we can hear you. Professor Nelson. Ah, for, for, for the second speaker. So, so, sorry, sorry, okay. Uh, we don't have, uh, so, we don't have a question for Professor Taxidis. We can move on with our, um, if not, we can move on with um, our um, second um, 
Um, our second uh, speaker, which uh, was uh, Mr. Kostis Mirlis, um, um, with uh, the subject Redating the Refoundation of the Hora by Theodore Metochitis, around uh, 1310 to around uh, 1315. Paracalo. Uh, so, Professor Nelson, you can uh, pose the, the question now, please. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I think this was a wonderful paper and uh, it, um, I, I would suggest uh, that Mr. Smirlis might, might want to look at, the, um, at the, fresco, the Byzantine style frescoes in the Cathedral of Genoa, uh, which was renovated uh, between 1307 and 1312. Um, there's a document there in the Genoese archives that remarks on a Byzantine painter from Constantinople by the name of Marcos. And that document is dated 1313. These frescoes in Genoa, uh, I argued in an earlier article in the Art Bulletin, are very close in style to the Church of the Cora. The fact that now we're putting the Church of the Cora back to just about the same time as the Genoese frescoes, I think is, um, is, is very interesting and, and tantalizing. So thank you very much for your paper. So. Uh, yeah, thank you, Professor Would you like uh, Nelson, to come? comment oh. and uh, uh, I was wondering if you if this is published uh, uh, your um, excuse me okay so thank you very much for your uh, remark Do we have uh, another question or not? So, uh, we can uh, pass... Uh, ah, sorry, sorry. I haven't seen... Uh, <laughs> Professor Esterhout, please. Please, we can hear you. Uh, I want to uh, thank Kostis for um, this really exciting work. And I think it now uh, poses a real challenge to uh, the art historian, um, art historians amongst us, for whom um, the style of the Cora uh, mosaics and wall paintings have been a sort of fixed point in the development of late Byzantine art. And um, I think if we move this a little bit uh, earlier, it means that we, were, we have a lot that we will have to reconsider in terms of how we talk about style and how we talk about the chronology uh, in art as, and um, I have argued for a long time that the, uh, there are the details in the Pamacaristos Paraclesion and the Cora uh, editions by Metachides um, seem to be related. And if we move the construction of the Chora earlier, it places it much closer to the construction of the Paraclesian at um, the Pamacaristo. So I look forward to seeing this uh, paper fully developed and in print soon, I hope, because I think we all want to talk about it. Very much. To the podium, please. Would you like to come to the podium uh, so that no, can I can see you? I just wanted to thank him and um, just to say that, uh, of course, the, I'm sure the implications are important in the art history, uh, this redating, but uh, they're also important in the um, uh, history of uh, literature and and uh, history proper because Metohitis and his uh, is so central to all of this. Thank you.
Thank you very much. So, uh, if we don't have uh, any other uh, question, we can uh, move forward to the um, presentation of uh, Professor Robert uh, Oosterhout, uh, who has uh, spoken to us uh, with the subject X-ray vision at the Hora Monastery. Um, I will uh, now have uh, uh, questions from the audience here, which are present in the auditorium of the um, World Museum, and afterwards uh, I have also uh, two electronic uh, uh, subjected uh, um, questions uh, for uh, Professor Osterhout. Do we have any answer, uh, question, excuse me, from the audience here? Yes? Yes, yes, yes. The gentleman over there. Yes, of course. <laughs> uh, we must uh, bring the microphone. I can't see very well. Yeah, thank you, Bob, for this wonderful uh, paper. Uh, I'm go I was going to talk tomorrow about this concept of these functional, functionless uh, spaces, but now you have destroyed my paper completely. But I'm going to talk <laughs> about doors tomorrow as well, so uh, it will complement your talking about windows. So I hope you, <laughs> you can uh, attend that, but yes, I'm very grateful for this uh, moving on into finding some actual use, some function for these spaces. So I think it's uh, very nice to, uh, for this going forward into reading the spaces correctly. Thank you. Thank you, Tasa. <laughs> okay, we have another uh, gentleman, please. Thank you, Bob, for this uh, fascinating paper. And I was really intrigued by the, the idea that these were all for uh, monks or hermits. And I was, you know, I'm, I'm not specialist at all, so I'm, I'm, I was wondering whether there is, you know, any parallels uh, of, of such, you know, uh, such spaces, such functions in other churches of the capital or elsewhere. I mean, the only thing I could think of is, uh, San Neophytus the Recluse, but I'm sure there's more. Uh, thank you. I've actually written about uh, spaces like this in churches in Cappadocia and uh, spaces from which um, a uh, hermit would have a privileged view into um, the churches. And um, I think that one of the things we see in a variety of Byzantine churches is that there's a special place set aside for the founder um, to have a privileged view, usually from the gallery overlooking, uh, uh, overlooking the nows. And occasionally there were places of rec of, uh, for recluses similar to this. I'm thinking of uh, the Church of uh, Christ Pentecoptis in uh, Constantinople, where the gallery connects to two small cells with windows that overlook the nows. Um, I think this is uh, something that maybe a lot more work needs to be done on, but simply looking at these spaces and why they were there has puzzled me well, you know, since I first started working uh, uh, on the architecture of the building. So I think there's much more we can uh, investigate here. Thank you. Uh, yes. Yes, yes. Hi, Nectaro speaking. Nectaro oh, Zara speaking. <laughs> uh, I, I take this opportunity to thank uh, Kostis and you, of course, for your presentations and to connect Kostis' paper, Kostis paper uh, if we redate um, Hora and come, come uh, before uh, 1320, and uh, with your paper, because we, we have another, um, I think, very interesting um, example uh, with um, uh, a window in the gallery of Panagio Digitria in Mistras, 
exactly in the uh, western north uh, edge of the gallery. And this is very important because as you present it, as you said, um, through the window, we can see above the tomb of Pachomios. So there is a strong connection between what can one see uh, from the window. And there is an explanation as uh, if we connect now Costi's paper, uh, that there are many similarities. If we go earlier in Hora, we can find many similarities in the architecture and of course in the painting, the dating of the um, paintings in the narthex of Panagia, Digitria and Mistras, uh, which is very closely to the um, uh, idea of the program in the narthex of Hora. So, thank you both. Um, do we have any other question in the room or not? I can't see anyone. So, uh, Professor Oosterhout, I would like to uh, read you the question of Archimandritis Ephraim uh, uh, Givisis. Dear Professor Oosterhout, I think that the little room between the central naos and behind the tomb of Theodore Metochitis could be a room for keeping the books and manuscripts for the chanters of the right course of monks. It is also can be connected with the founder himself, Metochitis, because the founders of monasteries in Byzantine period made special rules for chanting and celebrating special masses. In Athos are still in use such rules. I'd like to hear your opinion about. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your comments. I, um, this is certainly uh, possible, but it has always struck me that the position of this room with a nice window opening into the now at ground floor and then directly against the tomb behind it um, must have had a special function. Um, as to the manuscripts, um, I personally would like to see the, the North Annex um, perhaps on both levels as an area where manuscripts were kept because this is accessible um, from the uh, prothesis. And so that manuscripts that would be used liturgically um, could be uh, easily accessible uh, into uh, the Bima, even those that were kept upstairs in Theodor Metahedes, what I call Theodor Metahedes private chamber there. Um, but it's certainly possible that uh, this room also had a relationship um, to manuscripts of liturgical use. Okay, thank you. Uh, I have an, uh, a question also for you. Uh, Mr. Rafael Papanicolaou, a, P, a PhD student from the University of Ioannina. Uh, Dr. Osterhout, thank you very much for guiding us so beautifully into the innermost spaces of the Hora Monastery. The question that I would like to ask is, could, could the little chamber to the right of the main church have been a confessional? Um, that's an interesting question, and um, I don't have an answer for it. Do we have in the Orthodox Church in this period um, confessions similar to what we would what we know from uh, the Roman Catholic Church? I simply don't know. Okay. And uh, also another question uh, uh, by Mr. Tassos Papakostas. Um, how should we imagine those monks using the tiny dark cells? Would they climb in there to pray for a few hours, perhaps simultaneously for the soul of the departed? Presumably they would not spend the night there, right? Um, that I don't know. If we think about um, our our best uh, documented recluse, uh, uh, Neophytos on Cyprus, um, how long did he spend in uh, uh, his special place within the church? Um, 
Uh, so are we thinking about sort of part-time hermits or are we thinking about full-time hermits? Um, that's uh, a question for which I don't have an answer. But uh, my impression, just sort of looking at these very nicely detailed windows and how they're positioned within the architectural spaces and within the decorative program is that, um, well, you don't put a window like that unless there's a reason for it. Um, if it's for ventilation, you could put a tiny window like that little window that opens in uh, the Massacre of the Innocents, but not a big, highly decorated window that's positioned on axis and so on. Um, I suspect that hermits um, may have spent more time there than uh, uh, just simply going for uh, a, a short period of prayer. Um, I can tell you that getting into the chamber above the tomb of Theodore Medichides um, was not easy. There's not a direct access to it except through that window. Thank you very much. Uh, I think that we have no other questions for you, Professor Osterhout. And uh, now, are there any questions? I think there's a question for, from uh, Professor Nelson. I see his hand up. Oh, I can't see him. So, Professor Nelson. Yes, I, I just wanted to, <clears throat> it's a great paper, um, Professor Osterhout, great paper. Um, and, and to, all of the discussion is about somebody looking out from the window, but it, but it strikes me that the, these windows have, um, sorry, I share my video. Uh, it strikes me that these windows uh, have decoration around them and therefore they're functioning perhaps as a frame of something, of some body uh, from the, the space below. So instead of thinking of the windows as something one looks out from, we might think of them as a frame for the person that's there. Um, and if it's a holy person or a hermit uh, appearing before um, uh, the people in the church might have some function. And especially if that person uh, was chanting at a certain uh, certain moment during the rituals. Thank you. That's a, that's a great suggestion. I have um, actually, I uh, stopped short of putting a, a picture of a monk in the window above the tomb of Theodore Medihides because the idea of the window framing um, uh, the monk or a holy figure uh, in isolation there would be a little bit like the frame of an icon. So you would see um, the monk praying um, almost as if an icon has been incorporated into the scene. Um, so uh, yeah, certainly I think the appearance of whomever is in there, uh, I mean, I'll, I'll be, I'll think again of Neophytos on Cyprus as he pokes his head through the image of the Ascension, um, that seeing uh, a presence there would certainly add to the meaning of the space as it relates to the decorative program. I think that's exactly right. And uh, as, as I was saying what I said, I was thinking of my, in my mind of the images of Peter and Paul and, and all of the other framed icons <laughs> in the yeah. of the church. <clears throat> which are framed by a by an arch that way, and and we have a paper tomorrow from Michele Bache, who perhaps will will tell I'm sure will tell us much more about uh, issues of framing at the core. But but thank you very much. Thanks. Uh, I have here another question now by Mr. Dennis Politopoulos. Uh, he says that it's been a pleasure listening to you. Uh, do you really think that an open window would guide um, an artist, I think, to paint it in a church? Um, I think you're referring to 
um, the uh, the false window that I talked I about. I think yes, I think he in, he's uh, referring in the passageway. Um, it's uh, well, it's sort of fun. I mean, you know, you have uh, the opposite ends of the passageway. You have a false window at one end, and you have a real window at the other end. And part of the necessity of the real window is allowing natural light coming in from the south into the passageway. Um, but at the same time, um, what we see in the Periclesion is all of the openings into it um, are closed. So the triple arched opening from the outer narthex into it was closed uh, completely so that um, the space for burial uh, was completely closed off except to the windows that lead into these storerooms or dark passages or hermit cells. Um, so uh, part of that, I suppose, is if you're burying people in the Periclesion, it's gonna smell for a while. Um, so you want it to be uh, contained um, um, so that it does not uh, affect the other areas of the church. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, thank you, Professor Esther Houghton. And now, are there any questions for our fourth uh, speaker, uh, Professor Alexei Lidov, uh, who have spoken to us uh, with the subject Christ Hora, Theotokos Hora, Church Hora, the Byzantine concept of iconicity and the notion of Hora. Do we have a question uh, in the room? No? Yes, yes, we have one. Please. No, I just want to stress the importance of Alexei Elidov's interpretation of um, the notion of Chora as applied to, um, to the, the monument we are dealing with. I think one of the very important points, and I totally agree with you, Alexei, that your um, English translation of Chora tis achoritu is much more proper. So the space of what is beyond space is, I, I found uh, this interpretation extremely stimulating. Um, and you are right, obviously, in, in uh, underlining how misleading the popular etymology of, uh, um, of the church in, in, in Tichora may be. Um, but I'm also wondering about uh, the fact that basically um, all metaphors uh, are very concrete in uh, Byzantine culture and in general, in all pre-modern cultures, we know. So Chora is a uh, materialized um, metaphor which indicates that uh, the Virgin Mary, who is also the Ecclesia, no? and so a commu the community of believer, which is materialized metaphorically in the church, uh, is uh, um, the space uh, wherein the um, in, 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 uh, in circumscribability of, uh, um, uh, of, of God is circumscribed. Um, but uh, it's also a matter of fact that this monastery is located in an outside place, let's say in the countryside, in the Chora. So I was wondering to what extent the metaphor can be extended also to the location, the setting of the place in a, in a landscape which is outside in some way the anthropized part of, of the city. So how we understand the Chora huh, as um, something we apply to the interior of the church, but may it be that this notion may be useful from an art historical viewpoint to evaluate the multiple layers which may uh, have conditioned the perception 
of, uh, the, of sacred space also in connection with the outside uh, part of the church. I mean, it's setting in an open space. I, I don't know if I, was, I, if I managed to express myself properly. Uh, sh should I? Please, could you pass the microphone to yeah. Professor Lidov? Yeah. Just a second. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Michele, for your question. Uh, I think well, that we are quite lucky with uh, uh, Hora Monastery because it's actually a unique example when we have a six sequence of images of Christ and of the Virgin with Christ inscribed very clearly Horaton Zonton and Horatu Ahoritu. Well, and it's very clear message which obviously Fyodor Mitahites wanted to stress, to emphasize by all possible means. Uh, we have some other examples with such inscriptions, very few, by the way, and uh, for example, there is a church in Albania where the image of the Virgin with child over the main entrance is also inscribed Horatu Ahoritu, but it's it's quite rare uh, cases. And, uh, well, I, I think it's an interesting point about this um, relation of this concept to the uh, outside environment. But at the moment I don't see, I, I, I think that your interpretation uh, principally is possible, but um, now I don't see any uh, concrete uh, points or how to to establish this connection with this outside environment. But what is going on inside the church is quite clear, and as uh, Professor Osterhout convincingly demonstrated that the organization of sacred space, even on the level of architecture, was uh, quite deliberate and, uh, uh, well, what actually Fyodor Mitahitis was doing, he was um, not just as a teeter or donator, he was a person who, who was a major artist who actually organized in this church uh, the, the whole sacred space from architectural point of view, from the point of view of iconography, from many others. So he created a particular spatial icon which we now know as uh, Hora Monastery. And uh, the idea is that probably in, uh, it's, there is a possibility to find this form of creativity, which we called hierotopy, in many other examples, maybe not so demonstratively shown as, as in, in Kare Jami, but uh, I mean this form of creativity, of Byzantine creativity specifically, uh, is, is a great topic to, to, to study and to maybe to reconsider many other uh, examples which up to present moment we studied uh, only by tra traditional means. Well, thank you. Please, please, uh, Professor Lidov, you can keep the microphone uh, because we have another question by Professor Osterhout. Uh, 
Please, Professor Sorhout. Uh, thank you, Alexi, for your paper. Um, I'm always puzzled by um, the um, translation of the term Quora, and I think bringing that into the context here of our discussion of the monastery, but this, uh, the uh, ref reference to the Virgin as Ihora to Ahoritu is something that appears as early as the sixth century. Um, so it's something that's, uh, I think it's, it's uh, already in the uh, Akathos Tim. Um, so um, it's not something that's new with the Quora. But I like to think that it is used in specific ways at the Quora. And certainly uh, you are correct in saying that this is something that emphasizes the spiritual nature of the Quora as a monastery. But the word Quora has multiple meanings. Um, and I don't think that we can settle on one specific meaning, but all of the meanings of the term Quora come into play when we think about how Metahedes is seeing his monastery. So it can be um, the land of the living, it can be the container of the uncontainable, um, it can be the notion of space uh, dating back to Plato, but I don't think we need to settle on one specific meaning all of them work together, um, I think, to um, emphasize the spiritual importance of the monastery. So thank you. Uh, thank you, Robert. And uh, as I said in my paper, maybe it was missed, uh, that in my view, Hora is one of the names of God, divine names comparable with Hagia Sophia or Hagia Irini. Uh, and uh, in my view, uh, I mean, this uh, sublime meaning of horror for Fyodor Metahitis was the most important. And it was the, the, the concept uh in, another point why we don't have many other horrors like we have with uh, Sophia's and uh, Irini's, but it's another question. But the category of, the, the category of, of, of the name uh, and notion is the highest one in my view. And it's uh, it's a divine name. Uh, well, uh, yes, but I agree with you the, and and with Michele too that uh, I mean it's very Byzantine feature for for something to have um, multiple multiple uh, meanings and uh, different layers of, for, for, for interpretation. What, but uh, in, in the case of Horo Monastery, we have something uh, crucial and um, most important. From from symbolic point of view, and it's really very interesting uh, why Theodor Metahitis decided to stress this meaning in in several images. Uh, we, do, we we do, we don't know any other examples comparable with this. Uh, I don't know why, but for him in the early 14th century, it was uh, especially important to, to, to stress this aspect related to horror. Well, anyhow, thank you for your question. 
Uh, I don't know if we have another question for Professor Lidov. No. I would like to read to you also Mr. Uh, Nicholas Johnson's remark. I would like to express my appreciation to all the speakers. Thank you. Uh, it seems uh, that we have completed this fruitful session. I would like once again, on behalf of the organizers, to thank all four speakers for their participation in our conference. Their approaches on different but interconnected subjects concerning this magnificent and with outstanding universal value Byzantine monument will allow scientific research and exchange of ideas to move forward. Uh, they have informed me that uh, Professor Nelson has another, I will uh, stop and I will uh, <laughs> speak again. Uh, Professor Nelson, sorry, I have a problem with uh, technology that I can't see correctly. Uh, please. Well, thank you very much. I too have a problem with technology. Um, <laughs> I was um, just about to emphasize um, aspects of what Ale Alexei was saying, uh, I thought one of the most valuable parts of his paper was to remind us of this association of the word Chora, a word for God, uh, with Hagia Rini and Hagia Sophia. Uh, and then I, I bring to this the notion that the, uh, the Church of the Chora, I think it's Gregoras who says, uh, it, it goes back to the time of Justinian in the sixth century. Um, and I also would mention those uh, door, those uh, simulated doors that uh, Robert Osterhout showed, uh, which are sixth century and perhaps from High Sophia itself. Uh, so the original name of the Korah goes back to the sixth century, but it's, it's Medokiti's contribution to this that reinterprets this, this term uh, for the 14th century in a very new and novel way uh, through the, uh, uh, the disposition, the placement of images in the church uh, and the inscriptions that he adds there. Um, and perhaps in uh, uh, Professor Lidov's uh, uh, written paper, it would be wonderful if he could look more into the sixth century context of the word Cora, um, and also into that literature, which I can't recall in great detail now, about the origin uh, or, the, or the context of the words uh, wisdom and peace uh, as names of God in those two churches. So thank you very much, Professor Lidov. Uh, thank you, Professor Nelson. Um, I would also like, on behalf of the organizers, to thank the audience for being here with us physically or electronically. Finally, I would like to invite everyone who is physically present, now 35 persons, to a reception which will take place shortly in the foyer of the War Museum. Thank you very much.